Jesus, thank you for gathering us here and thank you for helping us in our takes and thank you for revealing your knowledge as we create our takes and spend more time at, with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So does anybody have any um, praise reports? Um, I could go. So yesterday, after registration, um, I went to the friends. Of, I went to the mall <laughs> with my friends, and I haven't been able to hang out with them since like the first week of summer break. And so I'm happy I finally get to do that again. And I also got my schedule, and I'm pretty happy about um my classes. So yeah. Man. I can also share. Um, I want to thank God because actually recently I started working out with Kuya Jeremy with like lifting weights and stuff. Last week, after lifting weights, I couldn't like lift up my hand for like a couple days, like two or three days. And I was like, Lord, why is it why is it so sore? But this week, I still feel okay. Like I can still raise it. So I just thank God for like the strength of my body to still not be as sore. Uh, so I just want to thank God for that. Man. Um, I, oh, okay, Mia. You can go. Go. Okay. <laughs> I'm thankful for God for this summer. Amen. I'm thankful because I now get out early every Tuesday. So that means that probably when I have volleyball, we can keep the same schedule if everyone's okay with that. So I'm thankful for that, that we might not have to change our schedule again because of my availability. And I'm also thankful because tomorrow I'm being forced to go help out with orientation, but so are my friends. So basically I'm getting forced to see my friends. Yeah. Um, Ian? Uh, I'm thankful that school is almost done. And then uh, we can start our, whatchamacallit, worship. Amen. Um, so today for our Bible readings, we're gonna go we're gonna be going over uh, John six and John seven. And we could just share our takes and I'll go first for John six. It says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the son of man can give you for God. The father has given me the seal of his approval. And really what I saw here was Jesus preaching to invest in God to invest into the heavenly places um, and not into earth because um, along with, you know, many things around us, um, earth is a perishable, you know, thing. And the reason why is because, our life on earth is nothing compared to our life in eternity. So why should we invest on the things that are not going to be part of what will be most of our life? This is why Jesus wants to invest into him and his father, because he wants us to spend the rest of our lives with him in a place we'll enjoy. Um, so does anybody want to jump in and go next? Um, I could go. Um, it's um, John 6, verses 26 and 27. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about the perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking, seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For, the, for God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. And these verses show me that even when people see God's miracles, they still fail to see the significance of them. Knowing God and his word help us not, not to just um go for god for the miracles to happen in our lives but to understand why these miracles have happened these these verses also show that 
they were not interested in eternal things, but in temporary things. We know that um, the things we have now will not come with us in heaven. So why um, care about these perishable things? We all need to work on this, but uh, we know that spiritual food lasts for eternity. So we should all spend our energy seeking the eternal life that the Lord can give us. Amen. I can go next. So what I got from John 6 is verses 68 and 69. It says, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. What Simon Peter here is, what Simon Peter is saying here is right. If we were to leave Jesus, where would we even go? Everything we need is with Jesus. We are who we are because of Jesus. If we left him, who would we be? Jesus has everything we need to learn about him and to be ready for whatever it is to come. Jesus is someone who helps us in everything, whether big or small. Why would we leave Jesus if Jesus would never leave us? Jesus loves us more than we could ever love him. We need to continue to believe and love Jesus. Everything Jesus says is true. We should never, ever doubt Jesus. Amen. Ayn? Uh, John 6. Where to go from John 6 is that it says here, Many of Jesus' disciples did not like these words. They said this thing that he teaches is too difficult. Nobody can agree with it. John 6, verse 60. What I got from this verse is that his disciples before didn't have faith, and they thought nobody will believe what the message was. But we can't be like them, and we are not them because we have faith, and our faith gave the message out. Amen. Uh, so we can do John 7 now. And my verse was John 7, verse 7. People who belong to this world cannot hate you, but they hate me. The things that they do are very bad, and I tell them that those things are wrong. That is why they hate me. And just to provide a little context, um, in this chap in this little section, Jesus was talking to his his brothers, like his, I think his biological brothers. Um, if you know, I'm I think. Um, but um, they were basically having this conversation, and his response to one of the things they said was that the world cannot hate them, but the world will hate um, him, Jesus, because he basically corrects the world. And what I saw there was that the reason why the world does not, you know, hate his brothers is because his brothers are chasing for the the worldly things. They're they're chasing to fit in. They're chasing to um, have all of these materialistic and worldly things just so that um, probably the world would not hate them and that, you know, they would fit the social norm or, or fit the standard that was set in that time. And it just shows us as, as Christians, as people who walk um, and follow God, is that it doesn't matter, like, how we act or you know what we do if you know what we do is in christ if what we do is according to god um it doesn't matter what we do it's just that we're going to be persecuted and we're probably going to be you know hated on um by the world because what we're doing is right and what the rest of the world um is doing is wrong and you know it says somewhere in the bible that those who are evildoers um yeah it says that somewhere in the bible sorry i, for, I forgot the rest um but I, sh I just saw this as you know um an important verse um that you know stood out to me because the world will really the world will hate um you know what is right what is you know of god what is holy but it will not hate instead it will love those who who want to fit the the social norm who want to fit into the the world and yeah anybody want to go next 
Um, I could go. So uh, mine's John 7, verse 24. Uh, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And this verse showed me that even when a person looks like their relationship with God is going smoothly, smoothly and their relationship with god uh their relationship with god could be struggling as well as their mental health which is why discernment is an important um thing to have as a body we need to be able to check up on one another and or open up and when we are struggling to do so we know that prayer is powerful so um no matter uh what um we are uh feeling or no matter um, what the body of Christ looks like, um, whether they look like they're struggling or, you know, everything's going smoothly, we should so continue to pray for them. Amen. Uh, I can go next. Uh, what I got from John 7 is that it says here, it says here, it says in the Bible, God will cause streams of water to pour out from anyone who believes in me. Water that gives life will come out from inside that person. John 7 verse 38. What I got from this verse is that God made streams so that we can merge into water. And when we merge with the water, the, the inside of us will be outside of us because people who believe in God get baptized and merged with the water and the water gives life when we get merged amen so why do we why do we want to get merged sorry i just remember that i'm supposed to be asking questions why do we want to get merged in the water i am submerged because the water gives life Sorry, can you say that again? My internet or your, I don't know. Because when we get merged, our sins will be washed away and yeah. Yeah, that that's a good answer. But remember what we talked about last week. Um, I think what Queer Jeremy said um, was that being submerged into the water is like a physical um, representation of being, you know, born again. It's like when you go under the water and then you come back out, it's like you, you are a new person and that's supposed to be, you know, a proof that we, we see with our own eyes. Unlike, you know, being baptized with the Holy Spirit that can be, um something invisible to us do you understand okay good job um yeah oh also sorry um also i am it's a submerge can you say that word submerge submerge yes that's two different meanings submerge is uh being i guess in this example it's being kind of just under the water or being like as Emil said, baptized, being put inside the water. So you're you're completely submerged. So you're completely under the water. Merge is a different, it's a completely different word. We will probably talk about it later. Okay. Good. Amia. What I got from John 7 is verse 18. It says, Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. But a person who seeks sorrow the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. This verse shows us that those people who talk about themselves only care about themselves. And people who seek to honor whoever sent us should speak truth. As people who seek to want to honor the one who sent us, whether it's God or someone else, we're going to speak the truth. There may, be, there may have been times where we might have been speaking for ourselves, but even if we did, we are changed and can still change into being a person who seeks to honor the one who sent us. As Jesus honored the one who sent him, we need to do the same. Amen. Um, so, Amia, why? Huh. Hmm. Um, yeah, so we can move on to your part, Leangelo. Good job, Amia. 
Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and let's first read the post. So the order is going to be my sister, Amiel, Amia, and then Ayan. Um, the cry of the bride in the end times, Ranatha, the disclosure of the end of the age is the revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1 verse 1. Sorry. It, it's, is it my turn? I forgot the order. Yeah, yeah, it's your turn. Okay. The, the cry of the bride, knowingly and unknowingly, is to see Jesus as the Son of Man, to know Jesus as the bridegroom king and judge, to expect and hasten his return. The cry of the bride is to respond to the ache of God. The familiar Jesus, Isaiah 53, we are familiar and more comfortable with the Jesus covenant in his own blood. This is a true and faithful revelation of Jesus, but it is a partial and not full revelation of Jesus. He is everything Adam could not be. He is the seed of the woman who will crush the seed of the serpent. Genesis 3 verse 15. The Lord will provide himself a lamb. Genesis 22 verse 8. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 verse 29. Uh, John was looking for a lion but saw a lamb. Revelation 5 verse 9 and 10 and 12. Daniel 9 verse 24. We can trust Jesus with Isaiah, with Isaiah 63 because of what he did and achieved as described in Isaiah 53. We can trust Jesus with all power and authority because he led the lamb. He... He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah 53, verse 7, Philippians 2, verses 5 and 9. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, he was submissive and opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he, is, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah 53, verse 7. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility, who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God. I did, I did not think this equal, equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but strive to himself of all privileges and rightful dignity. So as to assume the guise of a servant slave, in that he became like men and was born a human being. Philippians 2 verse 5. Wait, Philippians 2 verse 5 to 7 and PC. The humility of Christ, of the Christ Jesus, is how our posture must be in the end times. In the humility and submission of the Christ Jesus, we are to respond to his ache to make it well in the end times. There's a mystery in this cry, yet it's not always a mystery, because the bride will always sense the heart of the bridegroom, near or far. Amen. So whoever is ready to share, uh, go ahead, and then we can go on from there. Um, um, so what I got is that the cry of the bride is to respond to the ache of God. And our humility and submission to Christ Jesus is important because we are to respond to his ache to make it well in the end times. Whatever God calls us to do, we must do because we need to be able to follow him. Oh, because when doing so, the bride will, us, the bride, will be able to sense the heart of God no matter uh, where he is, here or far. Man, how can you tell what the ache of God is and how do you, like, allow it to transform the way you live your life? Because um, God aches for us. And when we uh, know why God aches for us, um, we will be able to change our ways because of uh, uh, because of him 
Okay. And then why does God ache for us? That's my question. Oh, because, you know, um, before back then with Adam and Eve, you know, that world, the Garden of Eden was a perfect, you know, world before Adam and Eve, and Eve sinned. And it's basically the ache of, of God's heart and his cry and his desire for us to be restored to him, which is why um, these verses that we talked about, especially in the last part, it talked about the humility of Jesus. That is why, you know, we are called to live like Jesus. We are called to um, have the humility of him because as we are transformed from glory to glory, uh, to be more like Jesus, we are preparing ourselves to be a, a bride that is ready, that is perfectly suited for Jesus. And we know that Jesus is perfect. We know that Jesus has no blemish. That is why God is desiring for a bride that is without spot, wrinkled, or blemish. And so that's that's why, especially in these times, we have to understand the cry and the ache of God for us because when we understand that he wants wants us to be pure he wants us to be holy not just for the sake of it but because he wants us to be ready uh, to marry the lamb you know to marry our bridegroom king and so that's why he desires for us he longs for us because he wants everyone in this world to to experience just immense love of, of the father the immense love of jesus the bridegroom and we cannot do that unless you know we really allow God to uh, to take hold of our hearts and allow our hearts to experience him in a new and intimate way. And so that's why, you know, God really desires for us uh, so that we may be one with his son. You get that? Okay. What is your, what is your summary? One liner? Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that um, God wants us to be one with him. Mm. Amen. All right, so who wants to go next? I, I can go. Um, what kind of stood out to me was the the kind of like the, the first part. The cry of the bride is to knowingly and unknowingly um, see Jesus as the son of man and to know him as the bridegroom, king, and judge. And it says a little bit further down, the familiar Jesus uh, we are familiar and comfortable with the Jesus covered in his own blood. And really, that spoke out to me because I feel like in my thinking, my first and mainly my only thought of when it comes to Jesus is the person who came down here and, you know, died for me, which which is a, a good perspective. But, you know, Pastora and in this post brought to mind of all of the other characteristics and all of the other identities that Jesus has, because um, I thought our, um, an example is, you know, a person can't just be, you know, just one characteristic. They can't just be, you know, um, humble. That can't just be like the one thing that defines them because people um, are complex. Their emotions are complex and our characteristics are, are all different and we have many of them. And since we are made um, similar um, to Jesus in the beginning, uh, we, we kind of have the same way of processing emotions. We have the same way, um, the same possibility of having all these different types of characteristics and all these different you know types of identities. And for Jesus, he has you know these different identities as the bridegroom king or, you know, the son of man. He is not just the person who died on the cross, but he is all of these other things. And in my life, I just want to notice that more um, instead of just being, you know, familiar with the Jesus who died for us. And why do you think that that, that image is the most, you know, like most common that, especially not all, not just you, but a lot of us see, you know, why do you think that is? Well, I think that because mainly the first thing we learn as a Christian usually is our salvation. And a big part of that is, you know, Jesus dying on the cross for us. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why, you know, a lot of us have familiarized Jesus as that and not as, you know, the, the bride or, you know, the son of man. Yeah, exactly. Especially in our and the growth of our faith in our relationship with God. And that's so true because I myself, um, it's so easy to see jesus as 
the the shepherd the one who died for my sins and the one who shed his blood and you know broke his body for me because yeah exactly that's what i learned as i grew up and yes it's so important like what you said this paradigm of him is still super important to learn and to understand but there is so much more to jesus than just the lamb that was slain he is also a lion that will return you know and Sadly, a lot of other Christians are not learning that side of him. That's why we are learning about this, because when pe when he does return and people do not expect him to return in this way, as what we've learned as a church before, people will get offended. And so that's why it's so important and so necessary for us to see Jesus in this light as a bridegroom king, as a judge, because when he does return, rather than, you know, responding in offense, we rather respond with a welcoming, you know, with joy, with, yeah, which is great joy because we know who he is. And that's why it's our prayer that as a body of Christ, we not just stay in the paradigm of a good shepherd, but we also grow in our understanding of him as a bridegroom king, as a judge, and as a fierce warrior who will, you know, really destroy the works of sin and the works of Satan in this world and will bring restoration. And so, uh, yeah, good job, Emil. So Amia or Ian, who wants to go next? I can go next. <clears throat> so what I got from the crowd by an end times post are these two sentences. It says, we are familiar and more comfortable with the Jesus covered in his own blood. This is a true and faithful revelation of Jesus, but it is a partial and not full revelation of Jesus. These sentences show me that we may know partial of his revelation, but we may not know his full revelation. Even if we know Jesus, doesn't mean we know him fully. We still have so much to learn about Jesus and so much reason to learn why we should continue to love him even more and more. We have so much to learn and so much more things to experience with Jesus and God. This post shows us that Jesus is more than the one who died on the cross, that he's more than the one who is covered in blood. We should see him and understand him more than that. Amen. So how would you do that personally? How would you grow in that understanding of, of just him being our savior? How would you be able to go about that for your for yourself? Wait, can you repeat the question? Yeah. So uh what how what steps would you take for you in order to learn that? you know, the different parts of Jesus about him being much more than a savior. How would you go about that? Like understanding him, like in the way, like how uh, he is in the Bible mm -hmm. and like really praying and trying to talk to him more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And another big part of that is just understanding his role in the end times, because once we have a greater understanding of God's plans and God's desires in his in this end times, we also have a revelation of how Jesus will be. Because uh, like what we've learned, we know that God wants to dis to completely destroy the works of sin, right? We know that God wants to really banish Satan into hell. And we know that God wants to bring complete restoration. That's why as we have a greater understanding of those things and, you know, let that be our prayer to read more about those things, to pray for greater understanding about those things. Things. When we do get a greater understanding of God's plan and God's heart for the end times, you know, that's when we also get to see a renewed vision of how Jesus will be. Because God wants the works of sin to be destroyed, Jesus will be not just a meek and humble servant, which he is, but he will also come as a fierce warrior, right? And because, you know, God wants to bring restoration, then Jesus will have to come as a judge and judge whichever is acceptable and not acceptable in, in the world that, and the, in the new, in the new earth and in the new Jerusalem that God is creating, right? And so, yeah, just really being more sensitive as to what God is doing in the end times and, you know, going through the different scriptures in Revelation and even in Isaiah about the different um, things that God wants to do in the end times is, is, is a really good way uh, to grow in our understanding of Jesus as more than just a savior. Um, so, yeah. What about you, Ian? Um, what I got from the Craft of Bride post is that it says here, 
Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. humility. Philippians 2 verse 5. What I got from this verse is that we have to put our minds like Jesus. Like we have to be humble, love each other, and do not sin. But if we do sin, we have to repent. And if and we have to have humility. Amen. So in your life, Ian, how do you try to live like Jesus? Like like just say uh in your school or in your or within your family how do you you know um represent Jesus's humility how would you go about that Wait what's the question again So how would you live like Jesus basically um in your everyday life in the small things Like how? Oh, you're asking me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, just say for example, uh, for for me and my sister, um, if ever my sister or even my parents, I feel like I would get annoyed by them rather than like lashing out and being angry. You know, like what it says, have the humility of Jesus. So rather than shouting back at them or arguing back at them, I just you know gently respond with. Um, whatever needs to be responded with, uh, to just respond with a greater love and a greater care and just say for school, right? Sometimes it's easy to be lazy. It's easy to slack off with all the work you do, but you know, Jesus calls us to be diligent in whatever we do. In fact, Paul says, right. And everything, uh, that we do, let it glorify God. So even in our school, you know, we can glorify God and we can live like Jesus by working diligently, doing what we need to do, um, not cheating in our, our schoolwork and those type of things. And so it's just small little things that we that we do uh, to really have a great impact in how we live our lives. So the more that we act like Jesus and the more that we live like Jesus in the small things that we do in our lives, those things stack up and those things will in turn, you know, allow us to live like Jesus, especially in these end times. It'll be so hard uh, to do that with so much deception and confusion going on. So that's why it's so important for us to start uh, like now, you know, in living in this type of way. So do you understand that, Ian? Yeah. Okay. So now what about from your life? What, like one example, what would you do? Uh, you want to do an example from school? I am. If if you you see your parents or your kuya or your ate and they need help and you're not doing anything, what would you do? Help. Yes, good job. Yes, amen. Thank you, Kuya Jeremy. Um, so does anyone have any questions regarding this topic or even John 6 or 7? We're good? Okay. All right, so my sister is going to close us in prayer, so you can go ahead. Um, Father God, thank you for today, and thank you for um, bringing us to this meeting and for giving us the wisdom and knowledge we need for our takes and help us to um, continue to enjoy to read your word, Father God, and help us to um, live our lives as you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.